am Danielle Ofri, Editor-in-Chief of Bellevue Literary Review, and I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's special event, the screening of the documentary, Alan Minter, with a discussion afterward with the creative team. Bellevue Literary Review is a literary journal, and we publish fiction, poetry, and nonfiction at the intersection of healthcare and the arts. About 15 years ago, we first published the work of the poet Hal Surowitz, and over the years, we've published him many times. In fact, these are all the issues of Bellevue Literary Review in which Hal's poetry has appeared. And Hal's poetry appealed to us primarily because it's wonderful poetry, but secondarily because it's funny. And it's often difficult to find humor in a literary journal devoted to illness and healing, health and disease. But Hal's poetry always brought an ironic smile, a flash of wit, and multiple times Hal uh, read for us live in our in-person events. So one of Hal's poems from this issue of BLR, in fact, the first poem we published of Hal's called Choice of Diseases. Now that I'm sick and have all this time to contemplate the meaning of the universe, Father said, I understand why I never did it before. Nothing looks good from a prone position. You have to walk around to appreciate things. Once I get better, I don't intend to get sick for a while. But if I do, I hope I get one of those diseases that you can walk around with. In this documentary, you'll get to see a bit about Hal's creative process, in particular, how he's incorporating living with Parkinson's disease, how it affects his poetry, his writing, and his living. I welcome you uh, to see the documentary and hope to see you afterward for the discussion. Thank you. Mouth yoga. When I woke up this morning, I heard strange exclamations coming from the living room. Huh. They sounded like extended yawns or a prolonged version of the ah you make for the doctor. I put on my bathrobe and walked down the steps to see what the noise was about. Uh, he said. And then came another. Uh, followed by. And ah, uh, I'm doing my mouth yoga, he explained, mouth open wide, ready to make another sound. Uh, uh, Hal started speech therapy uh, a couple of weeks ago, and his therapist had given uh, him homework. Aside from doing uh, mouth yoga, he's to read aloud 30 minutes a day, preferably from one of his own books of poetry. What have they done for you lately? Nothing. They have no feeling. So you get candy, yet you keep feeding them. But you never offer me anything. The idea is to exercise his mouth and vocal cord muscles, just like he exercises his legs. Ah, he calls out this time with a longer emphasis on the H. Meanwhile, the dog is lying on the sofa in a spot of sunlight, oblivious to the unfamiliar sounds going on around her. Observing this domestic still life, Hal doing mouth yoga and the dog sleeping in the sun, I walk into the kitchen to make coffee. So even though it's hard to understand Hal's speech, um, he's supposed to talk even, even because of the muscles in his throat and the muscles are connected to swallowing. So it's very important for those muscles to be working instead of him not ever talking. I'm going to take a vow of silence. He can't take a vow of silence. <laughs> so... A lot of people with Parkinson's don't talk at all because people can't understand them. And it's frustrating and it's hard, but he's got to talk. Does God exist? There's no proof that God is Some up there, there Mother said, said. But no one can prove that, that he isn't. isn't. Only the dead know, but they're too busy being dead to tell us. 
So if I were you, I would, I would go to Temple, temple and, and play it day. safe. If he's dead, all you lose is the time you spent praying. But if he exists and you didn't go, you'll be in big trouble. You won't like it in hell. And then how can I visit you? Angels aren't allowed inside. So that's interesting. So Hal's God is a different kind of God from my God. Yours is an angry one, right? Mm-hmm. What? It's still the same God. It's still the same God, but you're... Because sometimes... <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes he says that I pray for things that... I shouldn't be bothering God about, right? Right. That <clears throat> God's busy, so you shouldn't be praying about anything unless it's really important, right? <coughs> what? <coughs> That's Jewish belief, he said. Where it's a more Christian belief to pray for parking spaces, right? Right. Oh, your sister pays for parking spaces. Some, or she sends positive thoughts to park to get a parking space. Does it work? She says it does. <laughs> well, you know the poem that was so the most famous. I think you did it on MTV. You'd always start off by saying, "This." is my performance poem. Yeah. Chopped off arm. Don't stick your hand out the window, mother said. Another car could sneak up behind you and chop it off. Then your father would have to stop Stick the the severed piece in in the the trunk and drive you to the hospital. hospital. It's not like your telescope. The pieces snap together. A doctor will have to sew sew it back back on. on. You won't be be able to wear short sleeves. You wouldn't want them to see the stitches. You know the poem better than I do. <laughs> well, who could forget that poem? That is, that's one of the classics, you know. Did you, was it Love at First Sight with you and Mentor? Yeah. I thought it was. Was it, I know it was love at first sight for you with her, but it was love at first sight for her with you too? Yeah. I guess you'd never met anybody like you. This way. Stay on a trail. Well, then there came the time that... Uh, that we realized that, you know, something was going on with Hal. And uh, I think it was Mentor who told me, you know. Of course, that was an amazing thing, too. Just the fact that, uh, you know, Hal had such a loving man with, uh, and had written so many poems about his different girlfriends who didn't appreciate him. They were a laugh riot, but they also broke your heart. Um, And then he met Mentor. And it wasn't soon, it was soon after that, it wasn't long, that, uh, um, that it was revealed that, that Hal had Parkinson's. Um, the day that most people had Parkinson's before they were, they were diagnosed. Yeah, most people yeah. have Parkinson's before they are diagnosed. And about five years. 
Usually it's five years. It could be longer than that. Well, yeah, um, but it's hard to diagnose. I before So one way they diagnose it is if you respond to the Parkinson's medications. So when, when Hal found out he had Parkinson's, um, he was relieved to, before it was kind of like a nameless disease, and, and then once he found out it, there was a relief because he, there was a name for his illness, right? I was going So wait, that's your thought, right? Yeah. So Hal has a thought. He actually wrote a poem about this, that if cancer ever, sh that's what, this is what he just said, that if cancer ever shows up in his body, he's going to be, it's going to be, say, this body's occupied <laughs> already. Occupado. The cancer shows, it's going to be, say, occupado, that, <laughs> that, that the cancer cells will just run away because they're like, yeah. this body's taken. Yeah. Do you have a poem about that, right? Yeah. Yeah. The Parkinson Shuffle. I can hear Hal shuffling around the house. It's his signature step, the Parkinson step, when the foot slides instead of lifting off the floor. It makes my heart almost stop when I hear the shuffling get faster, as if there's going to be a stumble or a full-fledged fall. Don't worry, Hal always says, I'm not going to fall. But I do worry all the time. This makes being at home hard, listening for that almost fall. While I'm writing or reading, cooking dinner or feeding the dog, I listen to Hal when he walks. Inside the house, he doesn't use a cane like he should because it's one more thing to keep track of. And when the cane falls, as it often does, it scares the dog. So he prefers to hold on to furniture and walls, shuffling between them. Yeah, so don't let it rock back, Hal. There you go. It just means you'll, Hal, you'll just lift a little less. But that's okay. You're still getting strength. And you're getting strength in a better technique than if you, in, when you rock back, you use other muscles. So she, Laura's helping you facilitate a certain muscle, okay? Gluteus medius. Yeah. Wait, say it again. How? Yeah. What, you said something muscle? Uh, I know, no, I don't you didn't know you had that muscle, did you? Yeah. <laughs> you do. You do. There's three glutes in there. Maximus, medius, and minimus. Yeah. All right, so we're going to talk about how unstable you felt, okay? So I'm going to have you tell me on the thing, how unstable did we feel there? Perfect. Moderately unbalanced? Seven? Yeah. yeah? All right. Nice job. That's where I want you. Seven or eight. Good job. The hardest walks are after he's been sitting for a while when the body becomes more stiff and rigid. He takes deep breaths before attempting the first post-sitting step as he's learned to do in physical therapy, hoping it will propel him to a second and third. He wears heavy duty shoes, Doc Martens, and they still don't last long with all the shuffling, even with the thick, tough soles. We go to a special old fashioned shoe store, the kind that hardly exists anymore, where the salesman wears a tie, sits on a small stool and measures your feet, presses the foot inside the shoe to make sure of the fit. The salesman knows our names first and last, he even remembers the last time we were there. Come on, pretty girl! That's for sure. <laughs> mm.
Uh, so, 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 someone said, you need to get a service dog. And then we said, well, we have a dog. Um, and Hal's like, she's our service dog, meaning that we need service after, after her. Because she's... <laughs> Because she's a little anxious, and I didn't realize she's the um, typical poodle. I didn't realize they were this anxious or this energetic or this stubborn, but she's calmed me down a little bit. She doesn't have a sense of time. I thought you were going to say she doesn't have a sense of humor. She has a sense of humor, but she doesn't have a sense of time. So... Give an example of that. I'm giving them. What? I'm giving them. Oh, you don't give examples. Uh-huh. Anyway. I first found out about Hal at the New York Poetry Cafe. It's a place that I always wanted to go to. I've heard about it probably because my uncle uh, had been a poet. He was a police officer and a detective, but a poet. And it was always on my mind to go to the New York Poetry Cafe. And it must have been 20 years ago, maybe more, 25 years ago, I went with Jonathan, my son. We went on a Saturday night to the New York Poetry Cafe. It was packed with people. It was unbelievable. And I heard, I heard Hal. And that was it. I said, this is, this is something I've never heard before. I love this. This is wonderful. Uh, so I just tried to follow him. I bought his books, you know, and I, most of them are signed. One of them is still not signed. You have to sign Father Said. I don't have your signature in Father Said. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized we had a lot in common. We both were teachers. I taught in Queens. Hal taught in Queens. He taught the learning disabled. I taught the learning disabled. His parents lived in Great Neck. We lived in Great Neck for many years, and unfortunately, we both have Parkinson's disease, so we have a lot in common. <laughs> something's good, something's not so good, but that's the way it is. I He was shy, yes, a little shy, and. You know what I remember about you the most? When mom used to make lunch and she would put out a devil dog for you and I wasn't allowed to have one. <laughs> Cause Hal was skinny and he was the middle child and was allowed to get a devil dog. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember. Oh. And I snuck to get macaroons in the middle of the night. I wasn't allowed to get them. And I cut my finger. And I had to wake up our parents in the middle of the night to take me to the hospital. And the whole way to the hospital, mom was yelling, why did you take a macaroon? Why were you in that can as I was bleeding on the way to the hospital? So that was one incident that Hal remembers and I very well. well. She was very smart. She was very smart. She Your was friend. she was my best friend. Um, I felt she didn't she grew up without a mother. She lost her mother when she was three. And I felt that I related to her and eventually they moved to Great Neck to be near me and my three children. Some of the poems I could visualize her, especially like keep your hand out of the window, keep your arm out. I could visualize her saying some things that I didn't realize was funny that I, in the poem, I could hear her saying, you know, shut the window or stop chewing gum, it's gonna get in your hair or, you know, things that Hal wrote I do visualize her saying some of them. It's called Crumbs. Don't eat any more food in your room, Mother said. You'll get more bugs. They depend on people like you. Otherwise, they would starve. But who do you want to make happy? Your mother or a bunch of ants? What have they done for you? Nothing. 
They have no feelings. They'll eat your candy, yet you treat them better than you treat me. You keep feeding them, but you never offer me anything. Now, what son is not going to listen to his mother after she does a number on him like that? It's perfect. It's just perfect. Oh, man. I love it. Oh, I'm glad. She could say to him, listen, Hal, if you eat food in your room one more time, I'm going to kill you. You're going to have to eat for the next three days. You're going to be punished, and you're going to have to eat your meals in the bathroom. That's it. I'm not going to let you take one bit of food back up to your room because I can't stand it anymore. But she knows that if she talks to her son like that, it's going to be yeah, ma, in one ear and out the other. So she makes him feel guilty. She plays, plays upon his, his love. For, he, she knows he loves her. She knows it. But he's a kid. And she plays upon his guilt. And I can only assume it works. Because there's not, at this point, when you have a child who just won't listen, that, that will get them. Oh. In fact, you're going to be at my funeral. I selected, yeah. yeah I, I won't even discuss which one I picked. But your brother, Jonathan, I'm talking to my daughter. He has all the plans for my funeral. And your poem, one of your poems is going to be read when they lay me to rest. Oh. <laughs> In Queens. In Queens, yes, I already bought my plot at Queens, oh. the old Montefiore Cemetery in Queens. So you'll, I'll be back in Queens, and we're going to read your poems. Yeah. What could be more? What could I say? Oh, man. From the beginning to the end. Yeah. My thoughtful son, I can't kill myself. Mother said, because it's prohibited by Jewish law. So I'm relying on you to do it for me. <laughs> and you've been doing a good job. <laughs> you already took a few days off my life when you got mud on your shoes and left a trail all over the house. I had to get on my knees to scrub the floor, and I thought to myself, my son is only trying to be kind. He's shortening my life so I won't have to worry about old age. But if he really cared about me, He'd put an end to me right now. And Hal used to read that poem with this marvelous dead pen. But I also think that, you know, that's the issue of Hal having created a persona and a character. You know, his, his mom really is, it's both Hal's mother, but it's also a fictional character that he created. And I think there's certain stereotypes about Jewish mothers so that people don't really realize that this is a character that Hal is creating, you know, the way Shakespeare created Hamlet. You know, it's not, you know, Hal will make it seem like just reportage, but I think it's always been more than reportage. It's been that kind of process that an artist goes through of trying to hear a real voice or a real cadence. And I think, you know, we both of us agreed at that time. I think we didn't see a poem as like so much a beautiful artifact that you embellish and you make it more and more refined. We saw that maybe poetry is a force that exists between people. It's a way that people communicate without knowing it and you just really kind of try and tap into that. I always wanted to be a poet, but I never knew exactly what to write about. And uh, I thought words came out of the sky, and then I had a realization 
and you can talk about poetry and conversation. I like to be friends with poetry. We have news coming down. The money was not that vague. It was all among us, it was everywhere. I'm so pleased to welcome the creative team, uh, beginning with the stars of the film, Hal Surowitz and Minter Krotzner, as well as the filmmaker and creative collaborator, Ram Devanini and Susan Brennan. Welcome. Hi. Hi. So I'd like to start actually um, uh, with the creative team to talk about sort of how the documentary came to be. Sure, I can, uh, I can start. Um, so I actually ran a literary journal called Radapalix, and we published Hal a few times in the past. And at one poetry event where Hal and Minter were there at the New York Public Library, uh, I think it was the 42nd Street Library, um, they were there. And I remember um, listening to Hal's poems for the first time and was really just astounded by it. Um, and at that time, I don't think he officially told everyone, anyone that he had uh, Parkinson's. And, um, and I just, found his poetry just, I mean, not only funny, but warm and, and inviting and many other things. And when I learned later that he had Parkinson's, uh, I started thinking, you know, um, this was before I was making films. I was thinking, wow, I would be, make a really interesting story about a poet who's got such a unique voice and, and style, losing the ability to, uh, to read and to say his poems um, as he used to before but still being creatively vibrant. And, and then I met, of course, Howe and Minter in Philadelphia. And I realized immediately that the story expanded to more about the relationship between, between uh, these two wonderful writers and poets and the creative process that uh, was that developed between them. And of course, the beautiful romance and the love and respect they have for each other. So that was sort of the nucleus of where this documentary started. And, you know, of course, it allowed me to bring in poetry and and also a lot of the funny stuff that uh, how uh, experienced uh, with his family and his friends and everything else. So that's what, that's where it started. Um, actually, uh, Hal and 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 Minter, I'd like to ask you, what's it like to have your creative process, your private life, your living, be part of a film? Want me to answer? Yeah. Um, it was, it was, um, I was nervous about it at first. Uh, and then it just, it just became, Rom is, it was just so easy to work with. And it just became, you know, it, it, it was not very natural, actually. And, and it was actually interesting for me to see how similar to writing filming was, you know, and it was, it was really interesting for, to see that. So um, it was, I was afraid, at, nervous at first, but then soon got used to it. Actually, would you expand upon that a little bit? How, how is film similar to writing? We think of them as completely different creative arts. What did you see in common? Well, I, I think it was Ram, what I saw was um, that, that Ram was, was waiting to see um, what, he was not trying to control things too much. He, he let the process you know, and, and like writing, you, you, he's just, he was open to discovery, basically, in the way that writing is, is like that. So, um, and, and I think my sense of it was that he was, he knew there was a story here, and he was drawn to it, but he was also not imposing a story on our story. He was here to discover our story. It's, it, does sound, well, it does sound a lot like writing, where you often, you know, put down, you know, 20 pages, you know, uh, on the page and then, you know, edit away till you hone it down to the five pages or the five lines that, that really do, do shine. Um, Susan, can you tell you, um, Susan, tell us a little bit about uh, your involvement in the film. Sure. Um, well, I had the fun part of sitting with um, Hal and Minter and hearing all these great stories, um, hilarious stories about uh, their, their meeting and, um, 
I've worked with Ron before and Ron brought me in to listen to the stories, write down which ones um, he might want to focus in on in the film. And um, at, at one point, Ram and I talked about maybe this could be a narrative with, you know, they, they're such great characters. <laughs> um, so there's, there's many stories that aren't in the film, which uh, could, uh, there's room for expansion. <laughs> But I also um, am working with Hal and Minter closely on the anthology, which has been an amazing process of hearing so many different voices um, and people who have experiences with Parkinson's, whether they are loved ones, uh, friends, or um, themselves. So that's kind of just helping organize the process. Yeah, I'd love to actually hear more about the anthology. Um, Minter and Hal, can you talk to us about how this anthology came to be and what you're looking to do? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, we wanted to put a call out that it's okay to talk about Parkinson. When I first had it, I was in the closet. I didn't want people to know I put my changed my life, so I was very scared for the reaction. And uh, um, when I went to a speech teacher, she thought I had Parkinson's for a very long time before I even knew I had it. She said that my deadpan was a way of, of figuring out a way around it. And so I was surprised. I was diagnosed with what I had it for five, five years before I was diagnosed with it. And um, I went to New York University and I studied film there. I, I had Ralph Ellison as a professor. He wrote The Invisible Man. So I was always interested in film. And I watched a lot of movies. And a lot of movies tend to be literary. Some don't quite make it, but others do. But, um, actually, I find that really fascinating that the deadpan style that you've always had as a poet and a reader might actually be related to the Parkinson's. And we all thought that was just your real dry sense of humor, but mm -hmm. it's interesting to think maybe it's adapted to the disease or maybe the disease offered you this, you know, striking sense of humor and way of delivering your poems. It's, it's so did I. And, and when I went to therapy, my therapist thought, I developed the deadpan unconsciously to interact with the audience. Because I would get up on stage and I would have anxiety attacks. Like, um, like uh, I, I, maybe I didn't bring my poems with me. All of a sudden I had reactions. Like, why, why am I the one up there? Why, why can't I be like everyone else and just be part of the audience? I had to start to create my world outside for people to know me. Yeah. I and mean, I find that really intriguing. And it actually makes me think a bit of Oliver Sacks. And in his book, Music Ophelia, he talks about how different kinds of music with different rhythms resonate with different sorts of illnesses, different neurological illnesses. And I makes me think that certain styles of speaking and, and you know, styles of humor and maybe even literary sensibilities may resonate with different types of neurological illnesses. Um, Minter, I wanna go back to the anthology. Tell us a bit about that. Well, we received a grant for it and I always pronounce it wrong. What, how do you pronounce it wrong? <laughs> uh, NISCA, New York State Council for the yeah. Arts gave okay. us a grant to, to put out this anthology. Yeah, so, um, and so it was, um, I worked with, with um, Susan and Hal on it, and, and basically we did the first anthology that I know of, of um, writing about 
ever about Parkinson's in this country. I know that there have been some in Europe, but it, it, we, it was it, um, in two um, issues, fall and spring of this year, and we sent out uh, submission calls and and in some cases, we went to people whose who's writing that we really liked who wrote about Parkinson's and there'd be people with Parkinson's or caregivers or health care professionals or, you know, significant others or um, other relatives. Um, we even had a yoga teacher write something. So, so it was really an amazing project and um, and Susan uh, what, was doing doing a lot of editing, help you know, doing a amazing work on it too. So it was it was it was very moving to see you know I think to give people there were people who have never written before that wrote stuff and it, so share with us a bit about what you learned from doing what did you not know before you started this despite living with Parkinson's for this many years were there things you learned by reading these other types of writings and other perspectives? Well, it was, it was interesting to, um, to see, cause I know it from the significant other or partner as, you know, that viewpoint, but it was interesting to see it from the perspective of um, a child whose parent has Parkinson's, um, you know, and, and the, the, from that, to see from other viewpoints, um, um, cause I, cause in, in marriage, it's, it's a different kind of experience, but there's, there's also always usually an element of care where there's care added onto the role. Um, um, other people had humor, which not just how, but other people, you know, there's someone wrote a puppet show about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, other people had humor. I'm trying to think of what else I learned. Um, um, caretaker. Yeah, well, I learned more about caretaker, and that's for sure. I think it's more just the emotional fields, and and to see, you know, to see beyond, you know, to see the the. I mean, what I mean, one thing I've noticed is how, in my experience, is that everyone responds so differently to illness, and some people are really terrified of it, and they don't know what to say to us, and other people um are really great about it and 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 know exactly the kinds of things to ask or say or whatever and and people are just very um um frightened of illness so i did see a lot of courage in these stories and a, a lack of fear and a lack of and and a and op and, uh, there was a real feeling of a need for people to to, to write to 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 turn it and their experiences into the written word, I thought. I actually wanted to have visual art in there too, but you know, that was, we didn't really even, that was, we were just trying to deal with written word, but there are a lot of great visual artists. Some of the people were visual artists also. To, to echo what Hal said, um, that there was a sense that what I found reading ev everyone's pieces, um, just in general, going through illness, a sense of aloneness. Um, and what Hal and Minter have told me about Parkinson's is a lot of people are in the closet, um, as Hal referred to earlier, which I, I didn't know about. And then I started hearing different stories about um, that and how much that, even speaking from that very alone place, how much the writing created can create a bond or to get you, get you out of that aloneness, um, like build a way towards a community or just reaching. Uh, but I, I was struck by that through the pieces, even the caregivers, how there is just a sense of aloneness, like, oh my God, I'm going through this alone. Um, and how the writing is a way to connect with people. You know, at, at Bellevue Literary Review, um, we think a lot about how illness and disease uh, and healing and health uh, affect the creative process. I mean, for me, as my day job as a, as a physician, so I get to see it from both sides, but I think that the, the vulnerability and I think the such a sensory loneliness that, that illness engenders, I, I think those planes of vulnerability have a lot in common with where our sources of creativity are. And, you know, I, 
when when our, our lives are completely stable and, and boring, there's not a lot to write about or be inspired about or be uh, overwhelmed by. But I think illness in particular, when our bodies or minds um, begin to misbehave, to, to do things other than what we would like them to do, that's a particular type of um, instability and, and ambiguity that resonates quite strongly with the artistic process. So I, I think it's not a surprise that it brings up a lot not that anyone wants to get sick in order to have you know great writing, but I think it's no accident that that you know facing you know Virginia Woolf and so so many writers who you know it's when they face their illness that some of the greatest writing comes in. And and I'm wondering, uh, and this is either to Hal or or or, or Susan or, or Minter, if you have a sense of how Parkinson's actually affects the creative process, if at all. Yeah. Um, like when people ask me what I'm doing. I'm saying I'm practicing how to die. Because out in the Protestant world, like doctors don't like to mention death. They all, they're afraid of the D word. And I think that to be in control, to have somewhat control of the illness, is, is to be aware of that word. And that, and that, my time here is limited, but yet that, that shouldn't be negative. That could also be funny and positive. In one of your books, you 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 mentioned the lack of the beginning doctors mentioning death. Actually, my, my the, the doctor who diagnosed my illness. He thought I shouldn't go to support groups because I would see people much worse than me. But that would actually help me. He thought she, you shouldn't go. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we doctors are not big fans of the D word. We don't like it in real life. We don't like uh, talking about it um, for, for many reasons. And, and not just because the sense of failure for our patients, but I think our own mortality and you know existential fears, we, we prefer to, um, to not talk about it so actively. But I, I do agree that when we get into that space where we approach mortality, which in reality is for everyone. I mean, we all have mortality at some point and we often can't predict it. Sometimes disease allows us to have a chronometer for mortality. Um, whereas without that, we, we live either in oblivion or blissful ignorance or full fledged panic because one doesn't know when that will be. Um, and it, it does, I think, change the, um, the, the sense of urgency in, in writing. I think urgency does a, a, a lot for the creative process. Again, not that we want to be ill in order to, to be creative, but it, it does put in a different perspective. Um, and then one can choose how that perspective will be, right? It doesn't have to be only depressing, right? There are, you know, many, many funny ways to look at that. And I think how one of your, um, the uniquenesses of your writing is that you consistently find the humor and not a lot of people out there, you know, making jokes and laughing about Parkinson's disease. Um, but your writing enables us and, uh, you know, when you mentioned how people don't know what to say and, and you saw that uh, Minter in the writings, it's because people are nervous about saying the wrong thing and being able to inject some humor into that process, I think allows people to uh, suddenly realize, okay, whew, I can, I can if, if they can make a joke about it, well, then I can relax a little bit too. So I think it's also a public service to, to bring a little humor um, and irony in, into this um, process. The society has changed. Like Rachel Carson, she was a famous scientist when she had cancer. A doctor wouldn't tell her. He told her husband and wouldn't tell her. And so that happened a lot to the women at hospitals. When, and now it's changing. Yeah, th thankfully, thankfully that, that that is that is changing. It's sort of you know involuntarily putting someone in the closet. Yeah. Uh, Ram, I, I wanted to uh, to ask you a bit about where you see this film going. Has that opened new doors? Has it um, spawned other ideas for you? Um, well, I mean, for me, it, it was more of the creative process of, uh, of finishing it and working with Howard Minter. Um, but I mean, one of the important things we've uh, are doing in, in conjunction with the film is um, 
we are creating a, a Parkinson's uh, voice modulation app called HAL, H-A-L. Uh, no relationship to the movie, just to the <laughs> poet right here. Um, so this is an app where if you, and this is from my observation, you can actually see in the movie too. Uh, it's um, when people with Parkinson's use voice techniques and uh, and try to vocalize and uh, actually measure measure uh, the volume of their voice, and they do it routinely, like reading poetry or uh, children's books. I mean, it can vary. Text can vary a lot. Um, their speech improves for a short period of time, but it does improve. Um, so our idea is to sort of package all this into this voice mod modulation app and. Uh, you know, give it something very simple for uh, people with Parkinson's to use. So this is where the next iteration of all of this is heading towards after all of this. And um, does singing do the same thing? Well, let me uh, give that to Hao and Minter. They're the ones. Um, Hao, what do you think? Um, yes, there's. It's. it does do the same thing. And there are all of these um, Parkinson's singers groups and um, and yeah, they're, the singing really does. Hal's not as into it. He does it with the Mark Morris group on Fridays. At, um, he does it because there's some great teachers, musicians around New York City, but, um, but he doesn't usually, like he's not in the Parkinson's choir, singer's choir, and he's not into that. He doesn't do that, but singing definitely helps. Actually, can you comment a bit about dance? You mentioned Mark Morris. What is the role of dance in, in either therapy or development uh, during Parkinson's? Parkinson's is all about movement, moving the body from one place to another. And if you can walk like a dancer, then you have, you have a connection with your earth at all times. The idea is, is that walking Everything else is mental. You don't know think it's mental. But I have to remember to put one foot further than the other. And sometimes I count, I count the cracks in the sidewalk, or I count the sticks on the ground. That helps. So you learn different techniques, different ways to outsmart your brain. These teachers are amazing at uh, the Mark Morris dance group and and they're people in the class are from all over the world and and they meet and what's great is they ha they'll have the class and then they'll be the group will be in in sign um, separate groups afterwards in zoom rooms and then they would just have a discussion among themselves just about anything. Um, so how's really gotten to know these people? This was something that was started in the pandemic when there was the dancers couldn't perform. So, um, so it's been, and some of them, one of them is that woman that was in the documentary about Mark Morse, the dance, the, I forgot her name, but she's in there and it's amazing. Um, and then the dancing helps, helps with it too. And do the care caregivers also um, dance? You can, you can. <laughs> I theoretically will at some point. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to ask uh, to, to Minter uh, as caregiver over these years, um, how has your writing uh, been affected or, or changed by this whole experience? Well, that thank you for asking that. Um, um, well, uh, um, I, I did write, I have written a lot about Hal's illness and it helped me a lot to write about it. Um, and I, I actually wrote, wrote, began a memoir about it. And, um, and uh, I wrote like 200 pages and, um, but then I felt kind of weird about it because I felt like it was something that we're living right now. And, and it, and it's really, uh, you know, it's, as Ram got this before I did, because that it's really, you know, our relationship, it's not, it's not been an illness, you know, we're not defined by an illness. So, so I have written about it. Um, uh, you know, I've just done like these prose poems, short, short essay things. And I've loved doing that. I've loved being, it's really been an amazing thing for me to write them. Um, and I love them doing that. Um, but I do have to say that, you know, I, I, 
I do, I'm a caregiver, so um, I don't have that much time. And so, so I do struggle with time and being able to write. Yeah, a very, um, I think a common thing that caregivers uh, do face. Yeah. Um, Susan, I, I wanted to ask uh, for you, you know, being involved in this project, you know, what's next? What do you see coming once you have this anthology finished? I'm working on my own poems. So I'm also a poet and a screenwriter. I guess I'm just working on a script and I'm also, I have a four-year-old, so <laughs> I'm up to here. <laughs> I, my uncle had Parkinson's and, you know, different illnesses in my family have affected me. And I think the, the process of reading so many people's work who were so brave and uh, Minter said she saw a lot of courage in the work. Um, I, I think it's, it's opened me up to write a little bit more about my own personal um, um, relationships with illness and people in my family who, you know, I've, I've actually opened up to certain poems that I felt uh, were long gone. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> that's still there. <laughs> Reading people's work and I realized how illness can make you feel alone and shut you down. And that's what doubly made me so inspired by the writers I was reading to have that courage to, to just reach out. Because sometimes you're shutting down and you don't know you're shutting down. You know, um, as someone who has witnessed people go through illness who weren't necessarily artists. And we had someone who, um, one of the writers for the anthology, I, I think she's, she was the first thing she was writing, right, Minter? I can't remember. Yeah, Betty. One of the people yeah. was the first, thing, yeah. and it was, it was amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, I feel like I hope to take the courage and bravery of these voices with me to into my work. Um, uh, Hal um, and Minter, what's next for you guys? Well, I keep writing. So I'm, I'm writing. Even now, relationship poems. Hal's still writing relationship poems. <laughs> about the past. About the past. And, and of course, I have a new topic of Parkinson's. So I'm writing about that. So I'm busy. He's busy. Um, I'm. I have a novel that I'm trying to revise and. And I'm going to be doing, I'm going to continue with prose poetry. I like prose poetry. Thank you all so much for this wonderful conversation. It's been fascinating to talk about the artistic process of writing, as well as also making the film, but also reaching out to the wider Parkinson's community to see, you know, where does art fit into people's lives, both in sickness and in health, um, in, in being ill oneself and caregiving and thinking about that. I think it's no accident that um, you had so many responses to your call for, uh, for writings because I think people have so much to say. Um, and thank you all so much. And I will mention um, Bellevue Literary Review has many of Hal's poems um, and I encourage you to check it out. And thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.